All right, welcome to Peeling Sid Barrett. This will be episode nine, A Painting Black. And I'm going to try and throw a lot of ideas into this one, so I'm not sure how long it goes. And as I usually do, I'm just gonna kind of freeform it. I have some basic ideas written down, but how I move through all those ideas and express them is gonna be kind of fluid, so I appreciate your patience. First thing I want to kind of discuss is like we usually do corrections to previous episodes. One of them is I neglected to point out in Lucy Leave that uh, Mr. Barrett twists Butterfly into Flutterby, which is an interesting kind of twist on uh, letter connections or letter order. And also, I didn't really seem to get into the idea of the name itself of Lucy beginning in an L and ending in a Y, which would be interesting to some people that know the history of Mr. Barrett. Now he does have a tendency to clang within his uh, within his lines of rhyme and and um, you can read about clanging I guess if you like, but basically that's the idea of, of tying together similar sounding words uh, almost like an alliteration and I'll describe it as um, thinly rhyming within his lines if you take those I and I noises or the, the enunciations of those vowels and apply them across an entire line of rhyme you have the idea of clanging which is repetition of those things and we'll get into that a little bit more when we get into another song that he does, the first song that he does on Piper at the Gates of Dawn. Another thing I'd like to kind of discuss is the the theory of Dark Side of the Rainbow or Dark Side of Oz. I did give um, I did give a link for that earlier on as it ties in with Scarecrow. I haven't gone into that theory. I don't know if I will. Uh, I suspect I will at some point in time, but that's really not a big priority for me and the reason is because it doesn't necessarily definitively tie in with any of the works of Mr. Barrett and like I said I want to kind of focus on his his works at least for now so that is the intent of this video now a painting black I have chosen because there are a significant number of artistic influences that are kind of mentioning this idea of a black painting. And one of the works that we know of is a painting of black that had a red square in it somewhere, a small red square. That's how it's described by his sister Rosemary. And I'll give a link and some information to the interview where she discusses this painting. It's about 18 minutes into the um, into the video, and she does not give a whole lot of information about it. She doesn't give any kind of discussion about the nature of the black or the position of the red square. All of that matters, of course, because the position on a canvas of a square of red could signi signify different things. It's difficult to explain how important that is to people that haven't considered the nature of placement and tone and color in a painting symbolically. So she mentions this and, and additionally she doesn't really mention when it was made when she saw it. We know that it was around the time that he was staying at his mom's place. How we can assume that as reasonable but so far as I know there's no photographs of it and he probably burned it as he was want to do with many of his arts of work and the reason for that is also debatable. Now there are other references to this idea of a black painting and one of the earliest um, kind of ideas that, that ties to it or the, the earliest references that I can kind of point to is a song by Mr. Bob Dylan and it's called She Belongs to Me and it's basically about a guy that's dating an artist and she's an artist and she doesn't look back and she's kind of free by nature because she's an artist and this guy is going out of his way to do more and more to try and capture her or keep her 
Um, but it appears that the more he does so, the more he's kind of enslaved to her. She's she's free, and this is all interesting because it kind of ties in with the idea of the civil rights movement and women's rights in the 60s. And, of course, um, the revolution of birth control and all these other things that were supposed to be setting women free. And perhaps he's alluding to that. It's hard to know exactly. He doesn't specifically state that, but it, it's somewhat reasonable, and we've touched on that theme already. One of the lines that's in there that is important is that she can take she can take the dark from night and paint the daylight black. Something along those lines is what he says in his lyrics. And we know that Bob Dylan toured in England in 65 and 66, I believe. I've seen a video of him singing this song in England. And we also know that a lot of the English press and obviously a lot of fans in England were pretty keen on Mr. Bob Dylan. It's kind of interesting to me to note how the English scene was reacting to various artists and how that kind of differed from the way they were treated in the in the US in, in the US mainland. So for example, you have someone like Hendrix that was largely overlooked in, in the US and then he goes to England and he's just lights out everybody everybody's blown away with this guy so it's just a little bit odd the different treatment that these guys get but the point is a lot of people were well aware of Bob Dylan and they probably would have been at his concert we know that Mr. Barrett went to one of his concerts I'm not exactly sure which one and if he saw this song I'm sure it would have struck a chord with him because of the references to painting because as we know Mr. Barrett was first identified as a painter. An artist, yes, but also primarily a painter. So what are some of the other references that we can kind of point to that tie to this idea of a painting in black? Well, one of the earliest references beyond this that I can kind of point to that's tied to a painting of black is called out by Yoko Ono, Miss Yoko Ono, in her collection of works and drawings. Uh, entitled Grapefruit, and this was copyright, I believe, in 1964 in Tokyo, but also in 1970 in New York by Simon & Schuster. At any rate, she has a a work, and this, I'm, I'm referring to them as works, but they're basically just loose ideas that she puts together that are very interesting ideas. And so, one of the things that she has in here is called Painting Until It Becomes Marble. And within this, and it's titled 1961 Summer, so this is... I'm, I'm guessing that those dates mean that's when she wrote them down. I don't know. But she refers to an idea of having a writing or a painting or a design or a photograph and letting people kind of take pieces of it out. And if someone likes red, then take out all the red. And you also can go through and paint over in uh, black ink or black. So there's a reference to taking out the red and painting in black. I do think uh, that Miss Yoko Ono is very interesting mentally, creatively. I don't know that she was the best presenter of art, and a lot of people are kind of put off, I guess, by her personality. Um, I'll discuss that a little bit more later, but I will say that having read this, this collection of ideas, I can see that creatively, artistically, mentally, she is extremely gifted and it is very interesting to me this book itself is is very interesting to me all the different ideas that she kind of provides in it another one that we'll discuss here in a minute is the idea of painting to exist paintings to only be around after they've been photographed or copied in some way and this is 64 spring she mentions the idea of allowing people to copy your paintings and then destroying the destroying the originals. And I suppose we could kind of guess as to what the reasons for that might be. Uh, it We do know that Mr. Barrett destroyed most of his paintings and we don't really know exactly why. Perhaps it's a cathartic process. 
Perhaps it's because he read this book and got the idea from this. Uh, we do know that he had a copy of this book, and that's called out within um, within McRock's book, Psychedelic Renegades. So let's take a look at that really quickly. Now, Mick Rock is an interesting individual to me because he's a pretty laid-back guy, and he's a photographer, and he kind of got his first breakout with Mr. Barrett. I'll link a video of him kind of reviewing some photos and discussing his work. And on the very inner cover of this book is a photo of a car with streets at a cross. So it has an interesting exposure. And it's kind of an X form, which does remind me quite a bit of the painting that we discussed earlier. Uh, that was by uh, Mr. Barrett, and we called that The Boy and the Lion. Within this book... Uh, Mr. Rock mentions a few things. One of these is that uh, Miss Ono would sometimes visit visit folks at the um, at the flat that they were at the flat that they were all uh, living at at the time. And he also mentions being introduced to Alistair Crowley with Moonchild on page eighteen. Uh, by Mr. Sid Barrett. So there is a Crowley reference that does in fact relay the idea that um, at least Mr. Barrett was aware of Crowley and he probably was aware of the idea of of the importance of beginning and ending letters and forward and backwards readings of words, etc. On page 13 he discusses Yoko Ono coming around the area at 101 Cromwell and of course there probably were a lot of people that were coming around at that at uh, that location it was somewhat uh, famous i suppose with quite a few artists it is interesting that a group like hypnosis h i p g n o s i s um, were somewhat affiliated with cromwell and there's a lot of very interesting things and people that were there for a while anyway you could argue that eventually it just kind of fell apart into some kind of a uh, drug infested, I don't know what you want to cop out kind of an, an idea, but I'm quite certain that there were people there for quite a while that were trying to accomplish very, um, let's say forward thinking kind of ideals and at least discussing them. So the book itself, um, I find to be pretty easily read. I wouldn't suggest buying it unless you really are into photography because that's the major draw of the book, obviously. Uh, Mick Rock is a really laid-back, easy guy to get along with. You can tell just by the way he writes. He's non-judgmental. Um, he does eventually go on to work with Mr. Bowie, and he creates uh, Life on Mars, the video, and I'll link that, which I think is a, a really great video, really great use of color. His career was uh, amazing. If you're into photography a lot and this era, I, I suggest you go kind of check out a lot of Mick Rock's work because there's a lot, there's a lot in it and a lot to it. So uh, there's a connection to Yoko Ono's kind of swinging by Cromwell, and we know that at the time that Mr. Barrett was staying at, at Cromwell, there there is more discussion of this within a book called Sid Barrett and Pink Floyd: Dark Glow by Julian Palacios and. This book is, if you're into very specific detail, this is kind of the book to have. Now, I, I personally, I like the Rob Chapman book a little bit better because for me it's a little easier to read and it, it's also a little bit more personal. But this Julian Palacios book is detail-oriented to its core. Not just about the man, but also about very specific people, and very specific possible influences, and in even how Mr. Barrett put together sounds for songs and like what types of amplifiers he was using and all that, it's all in here. Uh, this is copyright in 2016 and published by Plexus uh, Publishing Limited. And he does have quite a bit of information in here about these various influences. One of the stories that he provides is um, kind of, 
this discussion about um, Ms. Yoko Ono kind of coming by and uh, more importantly the use or the reading of the book Grapefruit by Mr. Barrett and uh, he does mention kind of the the idea that he had this book at Cromwell and was reading it and rereading it and that's one of the reasons why I picked up the book and if you are a Pink Floyd fan you really need to have grapefruit because there are very interesting let's say similarities between that book and a lot of their music which is kind of hard to explain again it's a it's a little bit it's a little bit odd to look at those types of things and, and see some forms of connections and lines of connections or influences and not be able to explain them, but they certainly are there in a way. Now, um, let's see. So we've discussed grapefruit. We've discussed a bit of Julian Palacios and his, his mentioning of its, uh, of its possible ties to the idea of a painting, at least in, uh, or at least the book itself. He doesn't really tie that to the idea of a painting in black, but he does mention that Mr. Barrett had it and read it and, re and was reading it quite often. Who knows when he was reading that, but obviously this was before. Uh, this would have been in the late 60s or early 70s. This would have been before Mr. Barrett went to live with his mother, which was pretty much from uh, early 70s to the 80s. Uh, no, from, from the early 80s to the 90s. From the 70s, the 70s period, which kind of early 70s up into 1980s, uh, early 80s, he just kind of disappeared and was is living at, uh, at a hotel in Chelsea Cloisters, I believe. So, uh, what's another connection here, possibly, to the idea of a painting in black? Well, you probably already guessed one of them, which is the song Paint It Black by the Rolling Stones. Now, Mr. Julian Palacios does mention that Mr. Barrett met with Mick Jagger, and this is on page 51. So in this, he kind of discusses uh, a, a concert that the early Stones put on before they really hit big, and this was in July of 63, that happened at the Corn Exchange. And during a kind of a break, for some reason, Mick Jagger just decides he's going to go talk with Sid Barrett. So he just sits down with them and they're kind of talking. And the way he relays the story is that Jagger goes goes, and kind of walks right up to Sid Barrett for some reason. Who knows what that could be? Maybe he knew him already. Maybe he was attracted to somebody with Barrett. Maybe he was attracted to Barrett. I have no idea. Maybe it's just completely random. But uh, that is the story as it's relayed, and it has to make you wonder if that had some kind of an impact on uh, Mr. Barrett. And we've already stated how the Stones and Pink Floyd, one of their earliest songs, is King B. They both did it. So that's kind of an interesting coincidence. And, of course, eventually the Rolling Stones would go on to make a song called Paint It Black. Now this song, for a lot of people, including me, is a really wonderful song. And it encompasses kind of a lot of the ideas that we're talking about. So some of the lyrics are that someone sees a red door and they want it black, or they want it painted in that color. Again, very similar to the idea that's in Grapefruit. <clears throat> they see girls in, in summer clothes, happy clothes, and... Uh, they have darkness, and they have to have the darkness go away. So you have to wonder, why would someone have that form of reaction to a girl in pretty clothes? Or in to attractive in summer clothes? Uh, well, summer, obviously, we've already somewhat discussed in the idea of CMLE play. Summer, which is tied to a... a, a, a that's why they call it Summer of Love, is there's a tie to fertility and... and the games of May. 
there's mention that the cars are painted black and fl they have flowers and the love that will never come back. And the person looks inside and sees that their heart is black. And there you have a reference to something that is red, which is a person's heart turning to black. So in that case now we recognize that what is actually being painted black is the red door, is a red door of a person's heart, which is traditionally recognized to be an entrance way for emotion. So this person is trying to remove their emotion. Why would they do something like that? If you consider the nature of a line of black cars and their love is leaving to never come back and there's flowers, there's two ways to read that and almost everyone assumes that this is a funeral. But it also could be a wedding. And the idea that their love is leaving and never coming back would imply, of course, that their love has married someone else or is leaving with someone else and won't be coming back. And in a way, that would be harder to deal with than the, than the actual death of a loved one or is, is to be shunned by someone that you do actually love. There are uh, lines to people turning their heads and looking away, which is a little bit odd. Why, why would they, the, the assumption then, or the implication is that they're turning their heads and looking away from someone else. Who are they looking away from? The person, obviously, that is in pain. And part of the reason is, or could be, that they're either embarrassed for them or they feel sorry for them. Either one fits either one of the possibilities. There is a mention that something like this happens every day and it's like a newborn baby, which is, generally speaking, a very positive occasion. A newborn baby is a very positive experience, correct? Which would make you think of another positive experience. It doesn't tie in necessarily with the idea of someone dying. So if your loved one had died, it wouldn't be like a newborn baby. A better fit for that actually would be you would say like a stillborn baby it happens every day perhaps that was an original lyric and it was removed it was too dark who can say but the idea of a newborn baby is a positive thing or a subjectively positive thing to other people would be more in line with the idea that this is actually a story about someone getting married to somebody else and leaving and i'll finish this up with of course a reference to uh, one line is something about that their green sea is not going to turn a deeper blue. And they couldn't foresee, or they, would, they weren't able to see this coming. Uh, which is another kind of uh, interesting way of putting things, because it's not really stated whether they're talking about seeing that someone was going to die, or seeing that someone was in love with someone else and was going to leave them. At any rate, the green sea portion is important and it should make you kind of remember a line obviously from uh, Jug Band Blues where he where he references the green sea the, the sea is not green and who knows if they're influencing one another supposedly this song was influenced by Ulysses by uh, James Joyce we know that Sid Barrett uh, read James Joyce and liked it because he eventually does a song called Golden Air, which is written by James Joyce. Why this song is tied to James Joyce, I don't know. I've heard it explained that someone in the band said it's tied to the idea of turning their head until their darkness is gone, which is kind of odd because supposedly that doesn't appear in Ulysses, and I'm not going to go read it just to verify that, that that line is in there. But I do know that the sea is snot green is from that is from specifically that that novel and it does appear in jug band blues in a slightly twisted form sid says the sea is not green not the sea is snot green so it, at any rate we have a number of influences here that are pointing to the idea of painting being black and you have to wonder why is someone talking about a black painting now there is a a painting that supposedly mr barrett had 
that was a white on white painting and that's pretty interesting because there was there was a, a white on white painting that was um, put together by uh, some Russian painter Kazimir Malevich and it shows a slightly blue white square over a more yellow white square and white's an interesting color to work with of course because it it um, shows a lot of color within it so unlike a color like black which is going to be very difficult to see subtle changes of, of color tone in but white you can definitely see variations of it so this painting was made in 1918 and it's called white on white and it has a square as slightly at an angle which is supposedly to identify movement and the differences in color are to generate separation between the two uh, two white squares which gives it a bit of volume and um, I'm not sure exactly what this is supposed to be about but it was written or it was made in a very interesting time because this was not long of course 1918 after the October uh, the Octoberist revolution and it was painted the year after the October Revolution. Who knows if it relates to that at all? It's hard to say. But a painting of black on black um, makes me think of Mr. Goya, Francisco Goya. And he made an entire series of black paintings. And some of them are very interesting. We have already discussed some of Mr. Goya's paintings when we talked about the pose that is relayed in Arnold Lane as a possibility and the video that was made with the with the person uh, Roger Waters wearing the white uh, white undergarments and forming the X and what that might refer to in the church in the background and how similar that is to one of Mr. Goya's paintings if we look at the black series of paintings first let's let's discuss context all right, context, of course, is very important. These, these paintings were made towards the end of Mr. Goya's life, and he was suffering quite a bit. He eventually kind of withdrew into the constancy of his own home and surrounded himself, himself with these dark paintings, which is a little bit depressing to think about, but it does somewhat remind me of Mr. Barrett. Uh, he was um, suffering and in pain, and you'd have to guess, based on the, the content of these paintings, many of which are religious, that he was considering the physical violent nature of the world and the lack of what he would consider to be a genuine source of compassion, I guess you could say. So let's, let's look through them really quick, and I'll just kind of, I'll give you some background for some of them. One of them is an Inquisition Tribunal, and I, I do use this in uh, one of my songs for William Blake's uh, Chapel All of Gold. It kind of ties in with that idea. I'll link that song that I made for Chapel All of Gold by William Blake. You can check that out if you want. Now, in this Inquisition Tribunal is uh, showing a, a, a kind of a trial of someone and um, the effects of the Inquisition are pretty nasty at this point in time. This is not long after Spain kind of fell into a bit of a revolution after the Napoleonic forces and the Napoleonic wars that were extremely brutal in Spain. You have to kind of draw similarities, I think, to the mindset of Goya to perhaps people who have been through similarly very devastating events such as World War I and World War II and generated the lost generation and subculture and the beatniks and all these groups that were very anti-war and let's not forget of course that um, these are children of the 60s they were born in the late 40s they saw kind of what had happened to their parents or perhaps they like Roger Waters experienced the devastating loss of a parent and so this these series of black paintings that are tied to kind of the chaos and loss after war and the questioning of beauty and and I guess you could say the questioning of their own religion even is is apparent 
Another one is the burial of the sardine, which is a bit of a pagan ceremony, and I don't totally get what he's trying to relay there. He gives a Christ on the Mount of Olives and the Last Communion. Notice the extreme black backgrounds. Uh, there is another painting of a, of a partially buried skeleton which is called Nothing, and I also use that painting. The two most devastating paintings to me are, first, the painting Saturn, which most people are aware of, which is this grotesque, maniacal painting of Saturn devouring one of his own children. Saturn, of course, is a representation of time. Time is often given the color black symbolically. Notice the entire black blackness of of the background of the painting in a way this is a painting which is expressing the devouring of 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 a human form or physical form by time itself the inevitable destruction of all things is captured in this now this isn't a peaceful process if you notice this is a very physical and twisted process that's relayed in the eyes of saturn as he devours this this um, child of his own. Perhaps it's a questioning of the very nature of the destruction of life that Mr. Goya is trying to relay. I will relay one more painting and I would like to point out its, um, its value escaped me. So this actually is not the first time that I've recorded this episode. It wasn't until this morning that I looked at this painting and I realized I had kind of a moment of clarity, and it um, it affected me quite a bit. This painting is called The Drowning Dog, and it's not in black, it's largely in yellow. Although it is in yellow and ochre, and there are different shades in there, it is heavily shaded in black. And there is just the head of a dog, and it's entitled The Drowning Dog. What it's drowning in, I don't know. It's not blue, it doesn't look like an ocean, although it does appear that he's approaching a very large wave. And the background sky is tinted in yellow. This could be dirt or sand or mud, perhaps it's drowning in quicksand. It's difficult to know why this background is in yellow and, and brown. Uh, I would like to point out that a dog does have representation to us, symbolically. It can represent things like loyalty and uh, the nature of a true heart. It can also, because of the nature of the inversion of the letters, as we discussed in Crowley, dog inverted can be a representation of God. According to the Kabbalah, uh, the God connection to the world is through, um, well, largely through the color yellow. And, and if you are a Christian, you'll make that connection to, to it being to uh, Christ, the sacrificial Christ, the sacrifice of the flesh that could be captured in here. Of course, Mr. Goya was a very religious man to a large degree. He may have been deeply questioning his religion, which is why this has this golden yellow background. I don't really know. Alchemically, a dog can also mean the color gold. So alchemically, um, a dog being eaten by a wolf is, represents the purification of, of gold. And this is relayed in J.E. Serlo's book, uh, Dictionary of Symbols, that story. Notice the dog is facing uphill, and uphill or a wave, and is very likely to drown. Now, it would be very nice to know where the red, the red square was that Mr. Barrett had painted and how he had done that. Perhaps, you know, someday we may get more information from Miss Breen if she is so inclined to describe this. Perhaps Mr. Barrett had made that painting after his mother had passed and he was feeling this way. It's difficult to know. Um, when you look at the nothing painting where the half buried skeleton is pointing to the words nada which means nothing 
uh, implying that there is nothing, there's nothing more. It's just, it's an extremely nihilistic painting and it's painful to kind of consider that someone who is so, in, in Mr. Goya, who is so introspective and considering the nature of life appears to be coming to the conclusion that it's just nothing. It's all a bunch of nothing. Very different from Mr. William Blake, who apparently passed away in a, a fairly promising way. So there are all the references to the idea of paintings in black that I could consider as part of this video. It's a very deep topic. It's hard to know who influenced who and what exactly was going on, but as a work and as a discussion, what I'd like to point out is that there were quite a few people that were thinking about this. Mr. Barrett obviously felt for some reason inclined to make this painting of black with just a small red door or a small red square. And yes, Rosemary correctly identifies that it is a very dark place to be in. What the intent of that is, whether it's simply a memory of visiting with Mick Jagger and perhaps feeling all the potential tied to the idea of being a favorite and putting all this together and all the excitement of that time and having that gone, whether that's tied to the idea of losing a parent, uh, whether that's simply tied with the idea of the struggle and the depression that comes with facing up with the nature of mortality, it's really hard to know what exactly he was going through at that time. But artistically, that process is a very important process. And for me, when I put together something like this, part of the reason is because I want to relay, as I studied Mr. Barrett, I wanted to relay what was apparent to me, that he was attempting to become a whole person. And in order to do that, he was processing these things as an artist would process them. Not as an artist simply by the way that they draw a line and how clean their colors are and their shapes are, but as an artist who is consciously or subconsciously processing very deep topics and incorporating them into their art in order to in order to express things creatively to grow to be human to be a person it's all there in the artwork as we mentioned in the boy and the lion and that's a very valuable lesson for for everyone especially if someone wants to be an artist so <clears throat> I'll include one more um, idea as a link and within that it is it's an it's a very recent thing from MSNBC called grieving in the age of coronavirus and there's uh, a an interview and of course they they have a kind of a lead-in with mr. with President Biden's speech and everything and you can watch that if you want but about 2:30 in two minutes and 30 seconds in I believe it was they interview a rabbi and he's written a book, a book, and it's called, like, Beauty in Spite of Something, or something like that. And that man, that rabbi, discusses the idea of grief not being linear, that it comes in waves, and it's dealt with in waves. And that people need to experience that grief and not not kind of pass pass it over. And it, and it struck me as being an incredibly valuable lesson. So check out that link, and you can learn about his book. And perhaps it'll have something in there that is worthwhile to you. Now, the last thing that I'd like to discuss here is the nature of copyright. And if you remember, we discussed the idea that Yoko Ono and Grapefruit advised that you burn your paintings. And I'd like to suggest that it is possible that what she's doing is attacking the nature of the copyright system. And there may be a reason for that. Now, if you know the history of the Rolling Stones and a lot of bands, we already discussed this with John Fogarty and his inability to play his music because of copyright and contracts and being kind of taken out of the publishing rights of his own music. The Rolling Stones also had a legal battle with a gentleman named Alan Klein. And he actually owns the publishing rights to that song, Paint It Black. Apparently it was part of the contract. I don't know exactly how it all works out. But... Let's consider the, the nature of what a copyright is actually intended to do, which is preserve the rights and financial, um, 
the financial benefits for creativity with the people that actually make things. And if that's something that can be taken away, even if you sign on to it, if that's something that can be taken away and utilized in a, in a way that uh, perhaps isn't in line with the original intent, then you have to wonder why isn't that being reviewed? So for example, here's just a, here's just a few examples. If I were to make a painting, and I did, of Mick Jagger, and I and I tie that to a song like Paint It Black, and and that gets flagged, and it did, I will ask you, how is that any different than someone who is watching and playing the music and reacting to it? In other words, they're just saying like, oh, wow, that's pretty cool, or, oh, man, that I feel, I feel a lot. And that's it. So you basically have them talking, and that is acceptable. But if, if someone is to make a painting and provide that as a background, which I will argue can express through color, position, various other ways, much, much more about the nature of that song, interpretive, obviously. It's very difficult to recognize that that's happening, but of course... Um, if, if, if YouTube and other organizations are just using a simple program to go through and kind of screen videos or whatever, then they're not going to pick up on that at all. And it will limit the ability of a person to present artistic ideas, which is, of course, um, I guess, a, a bit at odds with the nature of the copyright system. So... Uh, I did put that together and it's all gone now and I'm not gonna try to put it back up again I don't want to have to deal with that. I made a whole series of paintings of different people that I'm going to talk about in this series and I wanted to include them as part of uh, The backgrounds as we were talking, but I, I can't do that. So Again, as I said, if you're wondering why I have the backgrounds I have and I display the things I can it's because these things are very limited by copyright and one of the things I'm kind of recognizing is that the copyright system, frankly, is quite broken. For example, if you were to utilize a song of, say, Beethoven, one of Beethoven's symphonies, Beethoven died quite a long time ago. <laughs> so how can his music be copyrighted, specifically when people are not changing it, they're just playing exactly, exactly as it's written? Who exactly is the copyright protecting? It's simply protecting a group or a corporation or a group of people that put together the effort and, uh, I'll, you know, I'll congratulate them. You know, they put together a CD or whatever that has Beethoven's symphony in it, but they haven't created anything. They have made a version that they are more than able to sell, but how do they own a copyright on it? It does not make sense, at least in my opinion. So, anyway, that's a lot of things to consider and kind of went on about this quite a bit. But I think now that we've gone through this, I'll, I'll leave off with the idea that my next topic I'd like to go into is, is Piper at the Gates of Dawn itself. I'll leave a link for Piper at the Gates of Dawn. If you would, uh, perhaps check out the songs, one of the things I did when I first listened to the album, because I knew one of the songs was written by Roger Waters, and the rest were written written by uh, Roger Barrett. And so I played a game, and my game was, which one of these is written by Roger Waters? And I figured it out just by listening to the album, which is pretty funny. So if you're so inclined, go ahead and listen to the whole album. Uh, we're going to start our discussion on Piper at the Gates of Dawn with the next episode. And... I guess that's about it. That's about it for now. I'll get, get into some other topics later on.